Hello. Thank you for joining this webinar on IBI's most recent survey of CFOs. My name is Brian Gifford. I'm the Research Director at IBI, and I'll be taking you through some of the key findings of the study, and then I'll open up the call afterwards for some question and answers. Uh, before we go too far, let me tell you a little bit about the Integrated Benefits Institute. IBI is a nonprofit business association. We're essentially the hub of a network of organizations that are looking for better ways to manage uh, workforce health and productivity. 90% uh, of our members are employers, a lot like yourselves, who do not provide health care or insurance services to the market, but are focused on the health and productivity of their own workforce. And if there's a unifying theme to IBI's work, it's that illness has cost, but health creates value. And we help business leaders and policymakers understand the toll that illness takes on workers' productivity and to recognize the competitive advantages of helping employees get and stay healthy, stay on the job, and keep performing at a high level. And we convey that message by conducting research, by providing business benchmarks, and by creating opportunities for people to share their own real-world experiences with managing uh, health and productivity of their workforce. Um, here are a few examples of the kind of work we do before we get to the substance of today's talk. Um, one thing we always try to do is when we do research, our focus uh, has practical implications for employers, again, trying to improve the health and performance of their business uh, by improving employees' health. So, for example, we've done a couple of studies on, on leave management under FMLA, and each one of these was intended to have some kind of practical implication to go along with the research findings. So when we find that FMLA requests are predictive of later requests for short-term disability and the duration of, of leaves, uh, whether or not people enter long-term disability, of course, then the practical implication is that even a request for FMLA leave, even if a person is not eligible, is some indication that they're going to have some kind of health need later on in the future, this is the time to start uh, directing them towards services that a lot of companies already provide. When we did a study of call center employees and demonstrated uh, what a lot of people uh, have already found in their own organizations, call center employees take more FMLA leaves than other kinds of employees, we matched that back to some of the reasons why this may be true, and we found that more people have uh, more people in call centers tend to have uh, health issues than people in other, uh, other types of jobs in an organization. Again, there's a practical implication of getting them to different kinds of services. Finally, we did a study of different industries' rates of FMLA leave taking, um, and we were able to show the high end and low end, and this is practical because companies are trying to figure out, do we have an FMLA issue in our company? If they can compare themselves to other organizations, um, they're able to see if they're on the high end or the low end or somewhere in between. One of the things we also do is we analyze different health conditions so that we can help employers prioritize their disease management and lifestyle management offerings in their companies, anything to help people get healthier, um, of course. And one thing we emphasize is that for some conditions, um, illness-related absences and underperformance on the job are going to be costlier than medical treatments. So all of these findings come from a series of research we did. Uh, we call them disease profiles. But so, for example, we'll show that, of course, what a lot of people recognize is that depression has a big impact on workforce productivity through absence, through people's inability to perform well on the job, but it doesn't really show up all that much in, uh, in medical claims. And so, in this case, we, when we talk about the cost of depression in a 100-person workforce, we're going to find that most of the costs are coming from absence, coming from presenteeism, and so on. Uh, we also help develop case studies of companies that are applying health and productivity management approaches. A uh, few recent lessons, uh, one is from American Express. Um, again, they do have a call center, and they do a really good job of figuring out uh, how people are performing on the job. This is much easier for call center employees and customer service employees than it is for other kinds of workers generally. Um, but they're able to link those actual call center metrics to people's uh, health records um, uh, anonymously, of course, using uh, other parties. Um, but they're able to link these things together and make a really clear case in their own organization how the health of a worker influences uh, the kind of performance they put in. And since American Express has a very clear view 
of how customer service drives its business performance, um, they can make a really solid business case in this way. Uh, we did a, a recent combined case study of Kraft Foods and Cummins, Inc. recently. Both of these companies were going to high deductible plans. They wanted to do so in a way that, uh, that still allowed people to get the kind of care that they needed. Um, as we know from a lot of research, if you raise the prices on people's health care, they're going to be less likely to use both essential care and, frankly, high cost, sometimes inessential care. They're going to cut care across the board. This has an impact on their health, which, of course, has an impact on their productivity on the job. Kraft Foods and Cummins took that into account when they were designing their program, and they tried to head that off before it became problematic. Finally, Nashville Public Schools, just, just so it's clear that you know, IBI, we focus on any kinds of uh, work organizations, not just large Fortune 100, Fortune 500 organizations. Nashville Public Schools did a really impressive job of linking the quality of its teaching in its schools to the health of the teachers that it hired. Um, and they discuss in, in pretty good detail the kinds of interventions they did to make sure that both of these were running as best they can. Okay. Which brings us to the current study. Um, one of our goals, of course, is to help business leaders, to help policymakers uh, recognize the, the, the health and productivity or the competitive advantage of a healthy workforce. And so we do this occasionally by uh, surveying chief financial officers. So this is the fourth time since 2002 that IBI has uh, surveyed chief financial officers, other finance executives, about health and productivity issues um, in their company and at large. And the prior survey we did was in 2011. And if you remember back then, major parts of the newly passed Affordable Care Act, or ACA, these were still in question legally and politically. So at the time, we didn't ask CFOs to speculate on how their organization might respond to however the new law played out. Um, but we did have a couple of questions and where they told us that uh, regardless of what happened in the courts, regardless of what happened in Congress, the legal standing of ACA wasn't going to be a big factor in whether or not their company continued to provide benefits. But of course, even at the time, we all knew that what those benefits might look like was going to be another story. So now fast forward to 2015, um, the Affordable Care Act then and, and now is part of the healthcare and business landscape for the foreseeable future. So courts have largely upheld the law. Legislative efforts to repeal the law have failed repeatedly in major portions of the Affordable Care Act have been implemented, including, importantly for our purposes, uh, mandated coverage for companies with at least 50 uh, employees. It was very recently 100 employees. And of course, there is the looming excise tax on plans that people discuss as uh, Cadillac plans. Um, these are going to be have important business inc impacts, potentially. So. Uh, last summer, when IBI fielded the survey, what we really wanted to learn was how companies have thought about their health benefits since the passage of the ACA and what moves they've made to align their benefits with their broader business goals. And one very important thing to remember throughout this talk is that on our survey, the questions referred to health-related benefits, and we spelled these out very clearly um, that we're not just talking about insurance, we're also talking about any company-sponsored policy or program that, that is designed to improve enrollees' health or otherwise reduce the financial burden of illness on the company. So this is very clear that we're talking about disease management, lifestyle management, wellness programs, whatever we're, whatever we're talking about. And we ask specifically about some of those, some of those efforts in the survey. So we got a, we got a pretty large sample. This, these were drawn from uh, people who subscribe to CFO Magazine. The, the research was done um, with the help of CFO Research, which is CFO Publishing's uh, research arm. Um, and we came up with 345 CFOs willing to speak to us, mostly from large for-profit organizations with very large revenues. Um, so again, 40% had revenues of greater than $2 billion, which would put them in the Fortune 1000. Um, but we still have the data, we still have the results, and we're going to dig through and try to figure out at a later date um, how different characteristics of organizations uh, impacted the results or impacted what CFOs told us about their companies. So one important point to keep in mind is why we surveyed CFOs about health benefits. 
rather than serving HR benefits executives. And there are two reasons, at least two reasons. Um, the first is strategic. CFOs are responsible for ensuring that financial resources further a company's business strategy. That's pretty much the job description. Um, and since IBI has contended for a long time that health benefits are an investment in better business performance, as far as we're concerned, CFOs sit at the intersection of the costs and the value of a healthy workforce. So that's one. It's a strategic reason. The second reason is very practical, as we've seen uh, in previous CFO surveys, um, CFOs do, in fact, have their seat at the decision-making table when it comes to benefits, not just health benefits, but all kinds of different benefits. So, for example, in this survey, we find that 85% of CFOs told us that they play some role in benefits decisions. 43% um, said they participate in decisions as an equal partner with other functions such as HR, such as benefits. They're not just approving budgets and even put a finer point on this, it was only about 14% of CFOs who said they make all or most of the decisions about benefits in their company, in which case you really know those, those CFOs are not just approving budgets. They are, are really uh, heavily engaged in strategic uh, issues with benefits at companies. Another important point to keep in mind is that in their capacity as partners in making decisions about benefits, CFOs have been able to make this conceptual link that IBI talks about, the conceptual link between healthier workers and the performance of their business more generally. So more than half say that they can make better decisions about benefits if they had evidence that would help them link uh, performance improvements that are due to health to different kinds of business metrics. So they can make that link conceptually, but again, this leads us to one of the most important and maybe one of the most troubling findings of the study for a number of reasons. Regardless of the fact that CFOs recognize that better information about health and performance could help them make better decisions, we don't see a lot of companies that are accurate or are actively measuring how their health benefits are performing. So now keep in mind that we're talking about CFOs and yet only 6% of the survey respondents told us that they have any information on the re, uh, about the return on investment of their benefits. And again, what I, what I think about this finding is it may say more about misperceptions of CFOs than it does about anything else. We expect them to always demand these hard numbers as hard ROI, but what the results of this survey show you is they like that when they can get it, they don't always need it, and they certainly don't always use it, um, partly because they don't have it, partly because it's not necessarily the most important aspect of what they're trying to accomplish uh, with their benefits. Okay. So only about one in four CFOs are, are measuring any outcome. They have any information on their program's outcome. So this would include wellness benefits. This would include lifestyle management, disease management. Um, for the most part, companies are going without information that tells them how well these programs are doing. And most of the time when they do have something that they measure, what they measured was employee satisfaction or employee participation in benefits. Okay. So we know a little bit more about what companies are not doing. Let's talk about what they have done since the passage of the Affordable Care Act. So it's part of the run of questions that we had. We asked CFOs how their company has changed different parts of their benefit structure since the passage of ACA. So for example, have they increased or added their use of some type of benefits, some types of characteristics or benefits? Um, have they decreased or eliminated others? Have they essentially left things the same? And it, as I'll discuss, we've seen two general trends that together resemble closely what has come to be known as consumerism in healthcare. So for the, uh, for the first part, I think a lot of surveys have corroborated this sense, is employers have increased their cost sharing. So about half of employees told us that they increased their, the, the, the share of the premiums that employees had to pay for their own insurance coverage. Um, they've increased their out-of-pocket amounts that employees have to pay. About 45% told us that. And about a similar amount told us that they have adopted, for example, high deductible plans or they've raised deductibles to the point that they become high deductible plans. And at the same time that cost sharing has been increasing, we've also seen companies are placing more of an emphasis on the health of their employees and getting 
employees to pay more attention to their own health. And so here we go again, about 50% of companies have enhanced the kinds of wellness programs or they've adopted wellness programs. As, as we've seen in previous surveys on health and productivity management, Pretty large companies are going to do, almost all of them, 90% at least, are going to do something um, in the way of disease management, return to work programs for people who go on disability, uh, well-being programs, wellness programs, and so on. So for the most part, these are companies that they didn't adopt new programs. They most likely enhanced their programs. Uh, we saw about 40% were uh, linking the premium cost to employees to different kinds of lifestyle things, whether that be quitting smoking, whether that taking cer certain kinds of screenings or tests. And we saw that about a third of the companies weren't just leaving uh, people's participation to chance or initiative. They were, in fact, attaching financial incentives. And so, again, if you take these together, both the increase of uh, the increased cost sharing more engagement of employees in their own health. These two trends pretty much describe, again, the consumerist approach to healthcare benefits. And a consumerist approach, of course, takes seriously that employees need to have more skin in the game in order to get control on the use of services that drive costs. But companies also want to decrease the need for expensive services by paying attention to behavioral drivers of illness, behavioral drivers of how people, in fact, use the healthcare system. Now, we also asked CFOs to project what their company might do in the next three years, and what they told us pretty much tracks with what experience and other surveys have found. Um, and so, for the most part, companies are not going to make any real dramatic changes in how they, they, they finance, for example, their health care benefits. So, one finding that I think now is, is pretty well established is we don't see a lot of companies that said, we're going to get out of offering healthcare benefits, at least not in the near future. So it was less than 6% said that they were going to eliminate benefits for full-time employees. We also found that about 20% told us that they were likely to use private exchanges to provide uh, health insurance for their employees in the future. Um, there are two ways to look at this finding. One is, this is private exchanges are a pretty new arrangement, so 20% of large employers that say that they are likely or very likely to use them is pretty good. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you have to balance that against the CFOs who, who told us that they were very unlikely or at least unlikely to use private exchanges in the next three years outnumbered these CFOs by two to one. Uh, we also didn't see a lot of uh, a lot of CFOs who told us that they were going to start converting full-time employees to part-timers or start lowering part-timers' hours in order to avoid ACA penalties or have to cover new employees. So again, employees or employers seem to be staying in the game. It partly helps explain why they're focusing on cost sharing and why they're focusing on engaging employees in wellness programs and lifestyle issues and so on. So, now that we know a little bit more about what companies have been doing with their benefits, let's go a little bit more deeply into what they've been trying to accomplish, which is really the heart of this, of this study. And so we gave CFOs a list of items and we asked them to identify their company's most important goals for their health benefits since the passage of the Affordable Care Act. What have they really been trying to accomplish in the things that they've done with their benefits? And they were instructed to rank the top five out of a list of, I think, ten in terms of importance. And the unsurprising finding, and we're talking about CFOs, so it's unsurprising that cost control is an important goal. Almost all of them said that it was at least one of their top five goals for health benefits. But one thing you have to consider is this. When we initially wrote the question about goals and we came up with a list of things that could be goals because of what we've heard from other people, we included cost control primarily as a throwaway answer. I mean, we're talking about CFOs. So we assumed that nearly all CFOs would rank cost control as the single most important goal. And then we wouldn't be able to use that really analytically, so then we can move on to what we think of at IBI as the more interesting goals. But it turned out that less than half of CFOs cited cost control as the most important goal for their benefits since the ACA. And again, this comes down to this, you know, one of the perils of 
caricaturing CFOs as basically the person who counts the money and counts the value of things, looks at the investments, and that's basically all they're interested in. But again, as we've seen, CFOs are partners with other, with other functions in the organization, and so it makes sense that they would recognize and, and have some stake in some of the other goals that, uh, that, that companies have for their benefit. So what else was important? Well, no single goal was as important as controlling costs, um, but there are two other types of goals that stood out. So one goal that stood out was essentially using benefits to help enrollees become healthier and structuring their benefits to help them become better consumers of care. So for every 10 CFOs who told us controlling costs was important, we had four who said what we really want to do, our most important goal, is to help enrollees become healthier um, and to help them use their coverage better. And of course, there is a cost implication of this, but again, this is for the most important goal. Secondly, uh, about an equal number of CFOs told us that the most important goal was to, to do things that, that improved a company's position in the competition for highly productive talent. So again, um, for every 10 CFOs who said controlling costs was the most important goal, we had four who would tell us that what our most important goal for our benefits is attracting new employees, retaining the talent we have, and helping improve productivity generally. Um, we saw a small minority, about less than, less than one in 10, um, who told us that they were primarily focused on improving their business performance. So what they're really trying to do, again, as it says here, is uh, improve customer service, um, improve business performance generally. That's what the goal of our, of our benefits are. Um, and again, it, it's, a, it's a small minority, um, but as we'll see, there are some interesting outcomes related to this goal. Now, we also found through a statistical technique called factor analysis that the importance of different kinds of goals tended to correspond with one another. So basically, if we knew the importance of one goal, it would tell us something about the relative importance of other kinds of goals. These things cohered together. And we use that information to create three scales that measure the relative importance of three different types of goals here. So when we talk about human capital goals, human capital goals going forward, uh, just understand that companies that we characterize as having strong human capital goals for their benefits, um, in their responses, they place more importance on workforce productivity, on attraction and retention of talent in the labor market. They played less, or, or, or they paid their place less importance on, we'll call it, complying with regulations, basically offering benefits in a grudging kind of way that just barely met the, the standard of the, of the ACA. When I talk about business performance goals, um, understand that these are the companies that they paid less attention to cost and more attention to things like customer service. So if you're wondering who are those 13% of companies that didn't even have cost control as a top five goal, uh, they're probably pretty high on this business performance scale. And finally, another scale of, of enrollee health. And these are the companies that, again, place more importance on helping enrollees become healthier, um, and helping people consume their care better, you know, do a little bit better in finding out the prices, do a little bit better in figuring out what is the right treatment regimen for them so they're not doing unnecessary care. And you should think of these different types of, of goals as more or less important rather than all or nothing. So there's, there's no company that only has human capital goals or only has business performance goals or only has enrollee health goals. Right. Companies are going to be a mix of these three different types of things, higher on one, lower on the other. And so once we're able to characterize a company's goals, we then went back to see whether or not the changes that companies have made with their benefits since the ACA or the changes that they've not made, chosen not to make, um, whether these make sense with what they tell us they're trying to accomplish with their benefits. And, you know, companies are supposed to at least make some kind of effort that we would recognize as, as trying to achieve their stated goals. Um, but we're interested in the patterns of how this is playing out because, again, what we're finding is that companies with different kinds of goals are doing different kinds of things and that if you approach a company or approach a CFO with only one kind of message about 
why it's important to have healthy workers, you might sound tone deaf. So, um, again, we find that the changes that companies have made are consistent with what they say. Let me show you some examples. So just for this first example, uh, what we found was that companies that have stronger human capital goals, companies that say it's very important that their benefits uh, are attractive to employees, that they help them keep the existing employees, that they help promote productivity. These companies, since the ACA, they've been less likely to increase how much cost sharing they've used since the passage of the ACA. Okay. So I, I showed you earlier uh, on an earlier slide that about 44% of companies had increased their use of high deductible health plans um, since the ACA. And this represents the average company in terms of their benefit goals. Okay. So they would be somewhere here around in the middle. And of course, as the average of just about everything else, it's the average company. Now, as we move from companies that are below average in terms of how important they see improving their human capital to the companies that are above average, we see a decline in the percentage of companies that have been increasing their use of high deductible plans. So again, we can see this gentle slope down here at below average on human capital, about 48% of companies if they're exactly below average by one standard unit, we would expect about 48% to say we have increased high deductible plans. Um, remember the average is 44%. We go to exactly above average, we're going to find that the number drops to 37%. Okay? And this makes sense if companies really are serious about competing for talent, um, they're going to need an attractive benefits package, and if people tend to have, or the, the people they're trying to attract and retain have some value for lower cost care, then you don't necessarily want to increase your high deductible plans. Okay, it's going to be different for kinds of companies, but that's the basic relationship. We see a similar pattern for employee out-of-pocket costs. So again, as you move from below average in terms of how important uh, uh, human, improving human capital is, you tend to see higher companies that are raising, or, or, or a higher percentage of companies that are raising employee out-of-pocket costs. As these goals become more important, we start to see the number of companies decline. Okay. We see the same thing for employee premiums. And although it's not, not technically cost-sharing, uh, we nonetheless see that companies that place more importance on improving human capital have been more committed to providing benefits generally than have been other companies, okay? So again, it, it, there are not a lot of companies that say, I'm going to eliminate coverage, right? So we're sliding from 5% to 3%, but this does make sense to the extent that employees who value health benefits strongly might be the ones that you want to uh, attract. It does not make you terribly attractive, frankly, in the competition for labor to say, we do not offer uh, health care benefits. So we found these patterns pretty much generally, and I'm not going to illustrate each one of these because I think you can get the general point here, um, but you do start to see a pattern where companies' goals are consistent with how their benefits have changed over time. So companies that use their benefits to help enrollees become healthier, to help them become better consumers of care, we find that they've enhanced their wellness offerings, right? both in, in the wellness programs generally, but also financial incentives, um, in the premiums that they start to, or, or their, their propensity to link premiums to different lifestyle factors. Again, quitting smoking is a popular lifestyle factor, um, taking or doing a biometric screening, for example. And these same companies have paid more attention to benefit design. So again, they've, they've stepped really into the consumerist movement but they've also adopted things such as value-based benefits where the, the reimbursements for uh, evidence-based treatments are higher than reimbursements for other kinds of treatments. Coverage of specialty pharma, uh, you know, formulary tends to be more common with these kinds of companies. And finally, companies that have been using their benefits to improve customer service and business performance, they're generally not increasing cost shifting as much as other kinds of companies. Um, but they have enhanced their coverage for very serious conditions that require uh, time off from work for disability, for example, or that involve very specialized kinds of pharmaceuticals. 
Now that's a really quick overview of the survey, the survey findings. We have a full report on IBI's website that you can download. Um, there's much more information in there. But again, I really just wanted to walk you through this, this main finding of um, that companies have been doing quite a lot of things um, since the ACA with their benefits. There have been a lot of changes. Some people know about pretty well. Some may seem novel. Um, but what we really wanted to do was understand what are the kinds of things that companies are trying to achieve through everything they've been doing. Um, and a really, a really important implication to this is um, use, this in, use this information for making the case for health investments as a business strategy. Because again, it, at least in our experience, much of the conversation about health, healthy workers, wellness, performance, productivity, cost, has really been about return on investments. Um, and as we've seen, there are a lot of companies that really are not measuring this space at all. It could partly be because they don't know how to assess the value of their programs. It could be because these are really not the, this is not the main focus of benefits at all. So I'm going to take you through some of the practical implications of these findings in terms of, again, how do you make a business case for health investments? Um, most of this is going to draw on IBI's body of research over the years. We're certainly not the only source of information, but I'm going to point you to things that are available from IBI on its website with, again, very practical kinds of implications. But a lot of what I'm going to talk about has been informed by input from absence management, business strategy experts, some of whom provided commentary that also appears in the full CFO report. So the first, and again, I, I think this is going to be uh, the clearest finding from this study is in order to make a really good business case for healthy workers, you need to understand what business leaders are trying to accomplish with their benefits. Okay? We know there's no one-size-fits-all approach to benefits, and we know there's no one-size-fits-all to making the business case. But again, as I just said, frankly, we're, from where we sit, the business case always tends to be about costs. What can we do to lower the cost? We know that's important, uh, but we know that companies also have other priorities for their benefits. And frankly, at, at, the, at IBI's forum where we first presented this material, uh, we had a panel of CFOs, and one of the CFOs put it very plainly, um, asking about controlling costs for benefits as a goal. It's probably not even the right question because nobody adopts a benefit. Nobody starts offering things to their employees just to control costs. Control costs is a secondary, uh, a secondary concern. What you're really trying to do, again, is compete for talent, improve your productivity, help people become better consumers of care, make them happier, make them satisfied, better employees. You do that in a way that's cost effective, and again, the primary goal is almost never, never uh, uh, cost per se. Now, if you really want to demonstrate the investment value of health, what you're going to need to do is focus on what leaders are your specific business or if you're talking about a client's business, what are they really trying to accomplish? At one company, it could be great customer service. At another company, it could be uh, product development. It could be supply chain management. It, when we talk about benefits and we talk about the goals for benefits, uh, it's really easy to get into a silo of thinking that the benefit is the ultimate end goal. But we know when we're talking to businesses, the end goal is whatever their, uh, whatever their organizational goal is. Um, so companies put a lot of time and effort into selecting employees, into training employees, developing people to accomplish some larger end goal that we're almost never talking about when we're talking about benefits. So if you want to really tell a compelling story about the investment value of a healthy workforce, you need to understand what these goals are first and foremost. You need to understand how they're assessed and how it's people, it's people from contributing to these goals. So in this really simple example that I'm showing, what a company is really trying to do is uh, improve customer satisfaction. They have really highly satisfied customers who are going to do repeat business, who are going to tell other companies to do business or tell other people to do business with them. Um, it depends on good employee performance. Again, you select people, you train people, you develop people, 
so that they can perform well, and then if you're not paying attention to how often they're able to come to work and perform at a high level, you're going to undermine everything all the way out to the end. Okay? This is how you tell a compelling story about a healthy workforce. Now, if you can absorb your company's big vision, you're really going to have a better sense of what kind of data you're going to need to make a compelling case for health investments. Again, it's whatever senior leaders use to assess how well the company is performing. Ultimately, that's where you want to uh, end up. And along the way, you're going to need to develop some specific health and productivity metrics. So we keep bouncing back and forth between this really high-level kind of, uh, of view back down to the nuts and bolts of how do we figure out what's going on with our workforce. So, for example, uh, health indicators is one category of kind of metrics that you're going to want to get a handle on. Um, this could be things such as health risk assessment surveys, uh, whether or not people exercise, whether or not they eat well, uh, whether or not they smoke. Uh, biometric screenings, very important for an overall view, and also reviews of people who have chronic health conditions such as diabetes, um, anything that would help people uh, get better care, get appropriate care. Um, on, on that case, if you want to understand what kinds of care people are getting generally in your workforce, you're going to want to understand how many employees, for example, are taking advantage of preventive care, especially in, in consumer-driven health plans where a lot of this kind of care is going to be free. Um, you're going to want to talk about general service utilization, big drivers of cost. What are the patterns here? As we know, emergency room use, for example, is not, um, is not only really expensive, it's an indicator that people might not be getting other kinds of care. And whether or not people are participating in the kinds of wellness, lifestyle management offerings that, you're, uh, that you are, are you know, providing through your workplace. And finally, tying this back to um, different kinds of cost drivers, lost work time, lost productivity, and certainly uh, medical care costs. Um, let's see. And then finally, um, if your company is typical um, or typical of what IBI generally sees among employers, you have at least some health and productivity data. Um, you might not think of it that way, but you very likely do. Um, it just may be scattered across different parts of your business, and it may be held by different supplier partners. So you might have disability information with your disability carrier. You might have health risk information through your health insurance carrier. And it can seem really daunting to put it all together, but I would just say that as, as complicated as it all seems and as many moving parts as there may be, don't let that delay you from getting started. Most employers out there can get a handle on health care costs. They can get a handle on health risks. They can get a handle on conditions. Um, it's really from there that you want to understand where the other pieces of information reside and how you're going to make them put to, or, or how you're going to make them all fit together. So really this is about coordinating all the different stakeholders, um, both people internally in different parts of the house, so people who are managing occupational, non-occupational benefits, people who are managing the health benefits, um, get them coordinated with the third-party administrators, with the different kinds of suppliers, and get them focused on the vision that your organizational leaders have for their company overall. Get them out of their silos and thinking in terms of this really big picture. That's all I have. Um, before I open up for questions, Again, I, I really want to emphasize that IBI, we tend to, we, we try to write things that are going to have really practical impl implications for people. We try to back this up in, in, way, in products that we have written and we make available to, uh, to members first and foremost, but also to the public. Um, so feel free to check out any of the resources. We'll provide a list of them uh, in the supplemental materials for this, uh, this webinar. And we're always more than happy to talk to people about uh, any of the work that IBI does. So let me open it up for questions. Do we have any questions? Uh, 
if we don't have any questions, let me just thank you for attending the webinar. And again, I, 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 I strongly encourage you to check out some of IBI's research material, ibiweb.org. Um, and if you're not already an employer member of IBI, remember that if you're not in the business of providing health and disability services to the market, we consider you an employer. Employer membership is always free at IBI. So you have a lot of access to a lot of different kinds of tools, a lot of different kinds of materials, a lot of different kinds of educational information just by being an employer member. Go to ibiweb.org, and I look forward to hearing more from you. Thank you very much.